All right. I hereby open the work session of the Springfield Planning Commission meeting. We have a roll call, please. Uh, Chair Rhodes Dye. Here. Vice Chair Buck, unless an excused absence. Uh, Commissioner Salazar. Present. Commissioner Thompson. Present. Commissioner Schmunk. Here. Commissioner Stout. Here. And Commissioner Weber. Here. Do we have any members of the audience? We do have um, someone attending. Okay, great. I would like to ask members of the audience who are joining us by phone or online to please keep yourselves on mute until you are called to provide public testimony. This is a meeting where the public may attend but not provide comment. There will be opportunities to address the Planning Commission later tonight in our regular meeting, which follows the work session around 7 p.m. Our first agenda item is Housing in Non-Residential Areas Code Amendments with staff Haley Campbell and Senior Player. Thank you, Commissioners. Good evening. Um, as mentioned in the agenda, this is a work session for proposed changes to the Development Code for income qualified housing um, on property owned by re religious nonprofits in 4.7.370, income qualified housing in 4.7.405, and various other sections that we're going to get into in the presentation. Also, with me is Chelsea Hartman, senior planner. Um, so, we're going to start a pre recorded presentation. Um, Chelsea's going to share it to the screen. There will be audio, and it's just a 24, 25 minute presentation. And then we just ask that you hold the questions till the end, and then we'll go from there. Hello, and thank you for attending this work session to discuss the housing in non-residential areas code amendments. My name is Haley Campbell. I'm a senior planner with the city of Springfield and the project manager for this code amendment. Also with me is Chelsea Hartman, senior planner. In a minute, we will start the presentation. As this work session is pre-recorded, we ask that you hold all questions until the end. We have set aside 20 to 30 minutes for Q and A. In 2023, the Oregon Legislature made efforts to address the state's housing crisis with new laws and $1.2 billion in additional spending on housing and homelessness. On any given night in 2022, at least 18,000 Oregonians were homeless, and state analysts predict Oregon needs to build at least half a million homes over the next two decades to keep up with demand. The legislature passed several bills that have prompted the following housing opportunities in non-residential areas amendments to the Springfield Code. The first is House Bill 2984, Commercial to Residential Building Conversions, which took effect January 1st, 2024. The bill requires local governments to allow conversion of a building from commercial to residential use without requiring a zone change or conditional use permit as long as the land is not zoned for industrial use. The next is House Bill 3151, Manufactured Dwelling Parks on Non-Residential Lands. It took effect January 1st, 2024. Manufactured housing makes up 8% of Oregon's total housing and 16% of the affordable housing stock, according to the American Community Survey data collected between 2013 and 2017. That's why House Bill 3151's major impact on Springfield is to allow manufactured dwelling parks serving households with incomes of 120% or less of area median income, or AMI, to be added to the bill's definition of affordable housing. The bill also adds property owned by a housing authority, manufactured dwelling park nonprofit cooperative, or nonprofit corporation organized as a public benefit corporation whose primary purpose is the development of affordable housing to the list of properties where local government is required to allow income qualified housing. The last is House Bill 3395, Residential Use of Commercial Lands. It took effect June 30th, 2023. House Bill 3395 allows housing within commercial land use districts if it is affordable to households with incomes of 60% AMI or less, or for mixed use structures with ground floor commercial with residential units that are affordable to moderate income households or 80 to 120% AMI. The bill requires cities to apply the residential density level 
most comparable to the commercial density currently allowed in the land use district. You might be asking yourself, what is affordable housing and why are staff using the term income qualified housing? To start, we thought it might be helpful to look at an example of the housing continuum. Often the phrase is used for unhoused and low income populations, but the city of Eugene and the city of Springfield have expanded the use of the term to include moderate income and market rate housing. Thinking of housing as a continuum allows us to consider the metro areas, diverse housing needs, and the impact of supply and demand. If one portion of the continuum is missing or stressed, the available options for certain members of the community become limited and the remaining areas experience more stress from increased demand. The continuum is broken up into five primary categories that range from community members experiencing homelessness without emergency shelter to those earning over 120% of the area median income. Areas of overlap exist between each defined bubble of affordability to demonstrate the transition from one bubble to another. Therefore, staff renamed affordable housing to income qualified housing to avoid confusion between the terms in the code. Across the US, housing costs are considered affordable if the monthly rent or mortgage on a property add up to no more than 30% of gross household earnings. Income qualified housing, on the other hand, encompasses housing that is specifically for households making zero to 120% of the area median income in our development code. Area median income means the median income for the metropolitan area in which housing is located as determined by the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department and adjusted for household size based on information from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. The examples here are for an individual and a family of four from HUD's 2023 fiscal year. The median family income in Eugene Springfield is $89,100. So at 50% AMI for an individual, that person would make $29,550 per year. And for a family of four at 50% AMI would make $42,150. Next, we're going to address how we are implementing the House Bills 2984, 3151, and 3395 code changes. This project is a continuation of work related to a larger Springfield Development Code update project that has been ongoing since 2018, involving a phased plan to update the entire Springfield Development Code. Updating the Development Code to support efficient, timely, and clear development review is part of Springfield's housing strategy. This project specifically revised the code to, one, address state law related to single room occupancy, two, add the conversion of commercial to residential use requirements in House Bill 2984, three, make significant changes to Springfield Development Code 4.7.370 for income qualified housing on property owned by religious nonprofits. Four, make changes to Springfield Development Code 4.7.405 to implement bills related to income qualified housing. And five, address other changes throughout the code, including significant changes to 4.7.100 for various districts, 4.7.375 through 4.7.385 for architectural design and multiple unit housing and minimum development standards 5.15.110 and site plan review for multiple unit housing 5.17.110. House Bill 3395 established a density standard for single room occupancy or SRO units. The bill states that each local government shall allow the development of an SRO with up to six units on each lot or parcel zoned to allow for the development of a detached single family dwelling and with the number of units consistent with the density standards of a lot or parcel zoned to allow for the development of residential dwellings with five or more units. Staff interpret this to mean that in the R1 district, a lot or parcel can contain up to six SRO units. In the R2 and R3 districts, 
where multiple unit dwellings are allowed, the density of SROs will match the density in the applicable district. To reflect these changes, the code amended the lot area, dimensions, and density standards in the residential districts and the definition section. The next topic is in regards to the creation of the new section 4.7.215, conversion from commercial to residential use. House Bill 2984 requires local governments to allow conversion of a building from commercial to residential use without requiring a zone change or conditional use permit, as long as the land is not in an industrial district. To make the code clearer and easier to interpret, staff reorganized and amended Springfield Development Code 4.7.370 for income qualified housing on property owned by religious nonprofits. The title of the section was amended. Staff moved the definition of place of worship from this section to the definition section in 6.1.100 and cleaned up one error in the code. Substantial changes were made to 4.7405 for income qualified housing. Staff reorganized the standards in 4.7405A through D to make the code clearer and easier to interpret and to address House Bills 2984 and 3151. Staff created subsections E and F in response to House Bill 3395. Sections A and B address the purpose and applicability of income qualified housing. The rest of this section of code was amended as follows. For 4.7405C, staff amended the section by one, including a manufactured dwelling park that serves populations with incomes of 120% of the area median income within the definition of income qualified housing. Two, including the addition of several income qualified housing owners, namely those owned by a nonprofit corporation organized as a public benefit corporation whose primary purpose is the development of income qualified housing, a housing authority, manufactured dwelling park nonprofit cooperative, or a utility provider who conveys property for one of the listed owners. And three, reorganizing existing code language into various subsections for clarity. For 4.7.405D, staff amended the section by one, creating a site suitability subsection, a development standard subsection, and a density and height in residential district subsection. Two, addressing the lack of income qualified middle housing standards in SDC 4.7.405 and three, stating what the density standards are for development in non-residential districts. This amendment is not a requirement in the House bills, but the code does not currently have density and height standards in many districts that don't outright allow housing, including industrial districts, medical service districts, etc. Staff provided three options in the draft code and are seeking feedback from the Planning Commission. The three options staff are seeking feedback on is for density and height for income qualified housing in non-residential districts. The first option would not apply any new or different density or height standards for income qualified housing in non-residential districts. Development would be limited by existing standards in the applicable district, e.g. height, setbacks, lot coverage, etc. The second option would apply the density and height of the R2 district. The density in the R2 district is 14 to 28 units per net acre and the height is 50 feet maximum. The third option would apply the density and height of the R3 district. The density in the R3 district is 28 to 42 units per net acre and there is no maximum height. At the end of the presentation, we will open the work session up for discussion and questions on these options. To comply with House Bill 3395, staff amended 4.7.405E by 1. Allowing income qualified housing in commercial districts and in mixed use structures provided they meet the area median income thresholds shown in the code. 2. 
listing the land use districts that allow only commercial uses and not industrial uses, a requirement in the House bill, to be neighborhood commercial, community commercial, major retail commercial, general office, mixed use commercial, Glenwood commercial mixed use, or Glenwood office mixed use districts. For 4.7.405F, staff amended the section by creating a site suitability subsection for requirements where this type of housing is not permitted and creating a standards and procedures subsection for this type of housing. A requirement in House Bill 3395 is to apply the most comparable residential density to the allowed commercial uses in the subject district. Staff are seeking feedback from the Planning Commission on two options in the draft code. The first option applies the existing density standards of the residential districts to the commercial districts and references the existing density standards in the mixed use commercial, Glenwood commercial mixed use, and Glenwood office mixed use districts. It also references the lot area, dimensions, coverage, setbacks, and height standards of the commercial districts. The development standards in the mixed use commercial Glenwood Commercial Mixed Use and Glenwood Office Mixed Use are referenced and stay the same. Here is a table comparing the density, lot area dimensions, lot coverage, setbacks, and height standards for the first option. As the House Bill requires staff to apply the most comparable residential density to the allowed commercial uses, staff reviewed the Springfield Comprehensive Plan land use element, which carried over plan designation descriptions from the Metro Plan for guidance. The Springfield Comp Plan stated that the neighborhood commercial comparable density is the R1 district. That R2 and R3 density can be allowed in the major retail commercial and community commercial districts, and that the general office district is intended to be an office transition area between residential and more intense commercial in the community commercial and major retail commercial districts, so R2 density was applied. The densities in the mixed use commercial, Glenwood commercial mixed use, and Glenwood office mixed use were kept the same. At the end of the presentation, we will open the work session up for discussion and questions on this option. The second option contains minimum densities for commercial districts and the mixed use commercial district when residential only and when part of a mixed use development. There are no maximum densities in this section because neither the commercial districts nor mixed use districts have a maximum density for residential. In the commercial districts and mixed use commercial district, the mixed use commercial district development standards apply. The development standards in the Glenwood commercial mixed use and Glenwood office mixed use are referenced and stay the same. Here is a table comparing the density, lot area dimensions, lot coverage, setbacks, and height standards for the second option. As the House Bill requires staff to apply the most comparable residential density to the allowed commercial uses, staff review the standards in the existing mixed-use residential and mixed-use commercial districts. The density standards in the existing mixed-use residential district were applied to the commercial districts and the mixed-use commercial district when building income-qualified housing under House Bill 3395. The development standards like lot area dimensions, lot coverage, setbacks and height were taken from the existing mixed-use commercial district for the commercial districts and mixed-use commercial district. The development standards in the Glenwood commercial mixed use and Glenwood office mixed use are referenced and stay the same. At the end of the presentation, we will open the work session up for discussion and questions on this option. Here is a table comparing the density, lot area dimensions, lot coverage, setbacks and height standards for the Glenwood commercial mixed use and Glenwood office mixed use districts. These are the same standards in the existing code and are not subject to change. As stated previously, at the end of the presentation, we will open the work session up for discussion and questions on the two provided options. Finally, we are going to address other related code changes identified by staff that are related to the housing in non-residential areas code amendments, but are not requirements in the house bills. A separate but related topic to the housing in non-residential areas code amendments were amendments to the standards in 4.7.100. 
staff moved specific development standards from 4.7.100 that reference a particular land use district to that district. These amendments will make the code more user friendly by listing standards that apply to a district in one place instead of needing to reference another chapter in the code. But what does this look like? A good example of this is the creation of Springfield Development Code 3.4.330 specific development standards in the Booth Kelly Mixed Use District. In the current development code, you can find public and private park standards for the Booth Kelly Mixed Use District in 4.7.200, residential uses in commercial districts in 4.7.210, and warehouse commercial retail and wholesale in 4.7.245. To make the code more user-friendly, staff moved these standards to the Booth Kelly Mixed Use District section of code in 3.4.330 and created sections specific to these types of uses. What other standards were moved from 4.7.100? Other standards that were removed from 4.7.100 led to 1. The creation of new 3.2.300 for commercial districts, 2. The creation of new 3.2.428 for industrial districts, 3. The creation of new 3.2.270 for the public land and open space district, 4 the amendment of 3.3.825 development standards for the urbanizable fringe overlay district. Five, the creation of new 4.7.330 public and private parks in residential districts as the standards in 4.7.200 public and private parks applied to residential districts. And six, the creation of new 4.7.335 professional offices in residential districts as the standards in 4.7.190 professional offices apply to residential districts. The next item is changes to 4.7.375 through 4.7.385 for multiple unit housing. For consistency and clarity, staff moved the standards in 4.7.385B, building orientation, and C, building form, to 4.7.375 to match the clear and objective standards that already contain building orientation and building form standards in the current code. Staff amended 4.7.380 to clarify that multiple unit housing is allowed in other districts besides R2 and R3, and staff renumbered 4.7.385 following the removal of sections B and C that were moved to 4.7.375. Lastly, staff made amendments to 5.15.110 for minimum development standards and 5.17.110 for site plan review when building multiple unit housing. This included clarifying that the MDS process does not apply to new multiple unit housing a site plan review or multiple unit housing review in 4.7.380 for the clear and objective tract would apply, and amending the site plan review applicability standards to clarify one incidence where a, a multiple unit housing site plan review is required. When in addition, expansion or change of use is for a non-residential use in a land use district that is not residential, and located within 50 feet of a residential land use district or residentially designated land. An exception to this has been provided when a multiple unit housing development can meet the clear and objective standards in 4.7.380. So what are the next steps? On April 2nd, the Springfield Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these amendments. A recommendation could then be forwarded to the Springfield City Council and Lane County Board of Commissioners who must co-adopt the amendments. We now like to revisit the draft code options presented in 4.7.405 and open the floor up to the Planning Commission for feedback as well as questions. Yeah.
And then we're just going to pull the presentation back up so we can go back to those feedback slides. Okay, so the first thing that we requested feedback on, and we discussed that in the Planning Commission briefing memo, um, which hopefully you guys had a chance to look at, um, there are basically like three options presented in this. So the first option um, is for density and height for income qualified housing in non-residential districts. So under our current code, we allow income qualified housing in areas where we typically wouldn't build housing, right? We might put it in an industrial district or a medical service district or other districts, again, where we don't typically require housing or allow housing. Um, so one, this first option that we're asking feedback on um, is would not apply any new or different density or height standards for income qualified housing in non-residential districts. So it would be limited by the existing height or setbacks or lot coverage standards in the code. And then the second option and third option, you would apply the R2 district height and density standards to income qualified housing in non-residential districts. And then the third option, you'd apply R3 district, the uh, height and density standards for um, income qualified housing in non-residential districts. So any, yes, any questions? <laughs> so, uh... We're, we're talking about income qualified housing. So we're already talking about, uh, and I'm sure sales are like, you, you know a lot about that. Jump, jump, jump in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like, I mean, we're, we're talking about maybe projects that don't necessarily pencil in less. They get grants and other sources of funding, right? So when we apply additional extra standards to those, we're making them even harder to pencil and we're making them need more outside funding. So can you tell us what the benefit of doing that would be? Yes. So I think maybe the benefit is for clarity. So I think, again, right now we don't have any density or height standards. If somebody comes in and they read our existing code and they're like, I want to build multiple unit housing in that district, but I don't know how tall I can build it, how dense I can build it. We don't have those standards in our code currently. They do not exist. So that might be one reason to apply it. And then on the flip side, like you said, you're applying like a negative, a drawback would be you're applying those standards to something that we might not want to, right? Um, some great feedback that we had from a workshop that we hosted in February was well, if a developer comes in and say they do want to build housing, well, now you're limiting it to this tall and this many units um, versus if we keep it as it is in the code, it would just be whatever the code currently allows. So maybe the, the current code would say you can go 60 feet tall and then your minimum setbacks and your you know maximum lot coverage. That would be the only thing that would limit it by. But you'd have to maybe look at the development code a little bit clearer than what we have or what we could put in that section of code. Does that make sense? Right. So you're, the positive is you're providing clarity. The negative is you're restricting maybe something that somebody would want to do. Exactly. I think to respond to that, yeah, the way I see it is, I mean, when we're looking at, at working for a, um, a developer of income qualified housing for the county housing authority, one thing that we're looking at when we're looking at sites is how many units can be built on the site, depending on this, the, the lot size. Um, and that under option one, we would have, um, like Haley was saying, a little less clarity um, when we're looking at sites who would see a lot and be like, well, how many, usually it's how many, how many um, units could we build there? Does it make sense for us? Would it pencil? Typically we have an idea of it pencils at 
the greater density we get, like the more units we can fit on a site, um, the more um, the more we can get that to work. Um, so having that clarity is helpful when we're looking at sites. But again, when we think about the actual developments, and especially if we're looking at commercial zones where this is the only allowable housing type, and commercial buildings tend to be um, larger than most residential buildings, then you could have a, have um, a case if we we're looking at option three and, and certainly option two, um, that if we're limiting it by units per acre, then that could potentially lead to smaller buildings where those all, all of the residential buildings are allowable in that area are dwarfed by the typically larger commercial uses. So maybe you have, um, they, they don't, the residential buildings are not in fitting with the, the rest of the neighborhood architecturally. Okay. So I guess follow up question. What do you think the typical developer of this income qualified housing would want us to choose? I would say that more having more flexibility is always helpful. I have a slight lean towards option one um, because it allows us to to um, look at, I mean, we have a little less clarity about how many units we could fit on a site and let, without bringing in an architect and saying, okay, if the setbacks are, are this big, how, how tall can we build it? But generally, I, I'm willing to bet that for most lots, um, especially in commercial districts where the lots tend to be a little bit larger anyway, that um, we could fit more units um, than we could under the second and third options on most lots. And that would be preferable not only for a developer, for but for the community as a whole, just being able to build more affordable sure. housing on the, the lots that we have. Very so let me clarify you. So you're saying option one, you can push the envelope more than the other two. You can try to accommodate those things that you'd like to do that pencil better than restricted under two. Likely, or three. depending on the lot size, you could the I could theoretically see a, a scenario in which the the density um, requirements under two and even three could be a limiting factor in that you couldn't build as big of a building or as many units as you would want. Um, if it was just the height setback lot, or lot coverage requirements that are just typical for any other building in that area. But well, with option one, what I understood, it had very, very few restrictions then. So, I mean, if, if somebody came in and they wanted to build a 12-story building for that, I mean, the only thing I would include that would be the setbacks and things like that. Is that, is that, is that how it would work? I mean, I'm asking, I don't, yeah. I just. So usually, like I said, there it's the existing standards in the applicable yeah. districts. So like, I don't know off the top of my head, but most of the time, um, like there's a max height for those districts already. Okay. Um, okay. Only in the R3 do we say no maximum. So even if you went to a commercial or industrial district, there, there could be a, a maximum height of 60 feet. Okay. Um, okay. I, I should say that, that's what I was trying to get. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I come, I come up with the, you know, over by Skinner's Butte where they built that one there, you know, mini, you know, <laughs> four decades ago, you know, yeah, and that uh, was, you know, and that was obviously. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I would think that typically, I mean, like, yeah, it, like Haley was saying that the height coverage might be that, that you think about what's allowable in commercial, like you think of a typical warehouse, like a Bymart, um, is probably a little bit taller than maybe the average two-story building, um, but if you can't build taller than 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 a warehouse, then you wouldn't be able to. The, even a residential use wouldn't be able to go up. Okay, thanks. That. I, I was just trying to say, if there's no restrictions, then what? Okay, I get what you're. Okay, good. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, um, this isn't a public hearing, but it is a public meeting. So I'll just, um, given the discussion, say that if you have a potential conflict of interest, um, you may want to declare that um, as we're discussing these code amendments. So I'll go ahead and just mention my potential conflict of interest as a housing developer who builds income qualified housing. Uh, well, I mean, I am leaning toward option one, but I'm interested in everybody else's mm -hmm. continued. Go ahead. So I'm curious about um, so Springfield in terms of um, building heights. Um, 
So if we start building up Poller, that's going to bring some other requirements. Fire department is going to have to have different kind of gear or something. Um, and uh, and then the particular location, if you got a 12-story building going up, you're going to need a lot more um, utilities, um, dense, dense utilities. So I'm not sure how to ask the question, but obviously that's a factor that Springfield has to consider. Um, and so uh, perhaps two or three might be better to help control that. So can you help me with that? Yes. So I believe what we have, if you've looked through our draft of our code, is um, we actually say in here that these uses have to have sufficient access to that infrastructure requirement. So you have to have sufficient access to streets, to stormwater, to sanitary services, all of those uses. So that would be factored into however tall they build it, they so, choose to build. build. So uh, the city, assuming for the moment that height was a restrict, height was restrictions was a um, something the city wanted to do, so they would simply not provide the fire equipment necessary for a, multi, a higher story building, and then they then the city could um, uh, refuse it. That's correct. Okay. Well, let me add in. I mean, I think with fire in particular, there's usually multiple options of how you can adjust that. So um, there could be sprinkling. There could be other ways of um, constructing it to meet fire code. Which so drives up the price of the building, which um, that would be. So I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, is if you if you have to make those accommodations, that will drive up the price of the building. And again, if your desire is to keep the height of the building down, then um, you could control the height of the buildings by those kinds of things. That's that's all I'm saying. Well, I think under the first option, there are height limits in some of the districts, but not all of the districts. And so they would have to comply with any height limitations if there is a height limitation in that district. If there isn't, then there there wouldn't be um, that as a limitation. So then it would come down to like water pressure. Is there enough water pressure to be able to reach the higher floors of that building? And that's really um, a sub issue more than it is a city issue. But those constraints are all baked into the code already because they have to figure out water pressure and fire and everything before they get a permit. So it's not like they're going to come in and build a 20 story building that we don't have the infrastructure to support. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Stout has his hand raised. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I'm curious. I know it's not exactly one of these options, but um, would in this case I, a two part question? One would is it possible that the potential buildings on these uh, within these options? So, like we're talking about, you know, within the commercial district, we're building a um, income qualified housing. Is it possible that that uh, commercial is still an option, like say on the ground floors? And then my second question is, is it possible that along with constructing the um, the income qualified housing that within the same projects, not only income qualified housing, but also um, also market housing could be mixed in within the same uh, building, let's say. Is that possible? Excellent questions. So the first question was about ground floor commercial. And under this first section, the section that you're looking at, on the screen, that is not a restriction at all. Um, you know, you, you could do commercial on the ground floor, residential above. Um, and then, you know, another bill that we talked about later, 3395, that's where we go a little bit more into market rate housing. Um, so this section right here is more focused on that income qualified housing section. Um, and again, there's kind of parameters in there. We talked about mm -hmm. in the very beginning about area median income, what those thresholds are. Um, so Right now in the current code, it's 60 to 80% of the area meeting income. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're looking at here on the screen. But again, when we get to um, House Bill 3395, which we're going to ask feedback on, those were the other two options we discussed. That's where you more see the market rate housing. And that's where um, the area meeting income is increased even beyond 
um, that 60 to 80 percent threshold to 80 to 120 percent area median income threshold. Um, so for right here, it's a little um, restricted based off of income, but um, under the other option, which we'll get into, there are more market rate housing options. Got it. Um, I, I think just so my feedback in general, obviously, we're trying to comply with a little bit of a state mandate and also trying to figure out, OK, what's the right thing for Springfield? Um, just my opinion is simply that large clusters of uh, of income qualified housing grouped together seem to be less resilient than uh, ones that are mixed in with more market rate housing. Just a any option that promotes a greater mix of those things, and I'm sure, you know, I don't know, this is a longer discussion, is probably going to see, um, I think, a greater longevity. But at that said, we all got to get some more housing in our city. So that's all. Thank you. Any other questions on this section before we move on to one and two, which are a bit bigger, bigger beasts? Yeah, so I don't know if I'm on section one or two. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the 33.95. That's the next section. All right, I'll wait. I'll okay. just make one one additional comment on the um, height restrictions as well, and especially in areas where there are no height restrictions for a specific commercial area, is that, I mean, we're talking about income qualified housing, and in 99.9% .9 of the cases that in, income qualification is in place because of public a public subsidy is in place, and 95% of the time that income qual that um, public subsidy is from a federal source rather than a state or a local source. And for all federal sources, it becomes exceedingly difficult to go over four stories, um, that there are a lot more uh, requirements that, that, especially environmental review requirements, that make it difficult to, to pencil and go above four stories for development. So um, in terms of, of like a 12 story tall development, um, it may be allowable, but in the current environment that okay. there's not much appetite for that. Thanks. The next section. Okay. Yeah. Well, and while we're transitioning, Christina uh, messaged me that she doesn't think that you actually would have a potential conflict of interest since you work for a public entity. Oh, interesting. So that might be something we want to just follow up before we get to the public. I'm sure I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah. And um, yeah. I can jump in real quick. The, the um, definition of a business with which um, a public official is associated includes businesses operated for profit. Um, and then some exceptions for certain businesses off operated um, for the purpose of generating revenue that are non that are non for profits, um, and so government agencies generally do not fall um, within the category of a um, entity that's operated for revenue. Um, but that's definitely something I can do a little more research on if that would be helpful. In 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 this discussion, as kind of a moot point, Christina, it yeah. might be for future discussions, but um, since this is just a work session and I won't actually be able to attend, unfortunately, our next session where we will be voting on this. Um, so I'm happy to mention it in, in the context of this work session as a, as a potential conflict of interest, but I won't actually be um, voting on the, on the item next meeting. Okay. 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 Moving, yes. All right. So the next option. Um, so as we kind of mentioned in the briefing memo, we have to apply um, comparable density for residential um, in commercial districts or as part of a mixed use structure. So the first option that you're seeing on the screen, this is to comply with House Bill 3395. Um, it applies the existing density standards of the residential districts to the commercial di districts, and then re references the existing density standards in the mixed use commercial Glenwood commercial mixed use and Glenwood office mixed use. And then it also references the um, lot area dimensions, coverage, setbacks, and height standards of the commercial districts and the development standards in the mixed use commercial, Glenwood commercial mixed use, and Glenwood office mixed use are referenced and they stay the same. So what this kind of looks like, I apologize, this is kind of small. Um, that was not the intention, but it was to kind of um, provide you guys with what this would look like. Um, so basically what you're seeing on the screen is 
um, a comparison from our comprehensive plan um, to for commercial to residential. So um, in that neighborhood commercial, the comparable density would be the R1 district. In the community commercial, the comparable density would be the R2 district. Mm -hmm. In the major retail commercial, the comparable density is the R3 district and the general office is that um, R2 district. And then again, you're seeing the mixed use commercial density standards. Um, that is how it is existing in the code. And then the, um, the lot area dimensions, lot coverage, setbacks and height, again, those are uh, the same as, uh, yeah, the same as, as referenced in the code. So the reason why we might not want to use this option is it's a little bit more complicated. Again, we're doing a one-to-one -one comparison and it's, it changes based off of um, whichever commercial district you're looking at. Um, and then I'm gonna actually have us go forward just a minute to the second option. So the second option, um, again, you're, you have to do that comparable residential density. So you're seeing minimum densities for commercial districts and the mixed use commercial when residential only and when part of a mixed use development. So House Bill 3395 allows you to do uh, residential and commercial districts and then residential in a mixed use structure um, when the ground floor is commercial and the rest would be residential. And then we applied no maximum densities in this section because there are no maximum densities in the commercial districts or mixed use districts. You just have that minimum density requirement. Um, and then again, in the commercial districts and the mixed use district, the mixed use development standards apply. So you're looking at your lot area, um, dimensions, lot coverage, those things. Um, that's what you're looking at as the comparison. And then the Glenwood commercial mixed use and Glenwood office mixed use, they're referenced and they stay the same. So the table is a little bit simpler. <laughs> again, um, you've got your minimum uh, density, which that is uh, 20 units in uh, residential and commercial di commercial districts. And then in a mixed use structure, the minimum density is 12 units. Again, no maximum density. Um, we do have, you'll see in the bottom clause there, there's a, if you are building less than 20 units per acre in a mixed use structure, then we want at least 10% of the total gross floor area in a non-residential use. So the reason that this is significant is that in our mixed use commercial district right now, there is a minimum 60% commercial requirement to 40% residential um, commercial allowance. So under this current uh, provision, our only requirement is that you have 10% commercial when you're in a mixed use structure on the ground floor. The rest can be residential. Um, and that's just for the, this income qualified housing You're option. You're setting up that requirement quite a bit. Exactly. Um, and that was also, that was the feedback that we kind of got from our workshops was that um, people were, some developers were concerned about being able to meet that 60 to 40% commercial to residential um, requirement in our existing mixed use commercial zone. So for income qualified housing, especially if you're building a mixed use structure, we want to encourage you to build as much income qualified housing as possible. We still need to require you to build some form of commercial housing or commercial development, but um, we kind of keep it as minimum as possible. So that's a breakdown. We can start with either, let's start with option one <laughs> and then we'll go um, back to option two. I'm a little bit lost. <laughs> I feel alone on that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I know we're talking about mixed use districts, uh, but I'm a little confused, like, why we're applying, we're applying residential density standards to them mm -hmm. instead of commercial density standards to them. Yes. Is that part of the law or is that a choice? That, that, that is make? a part of the House bill. So the House okay. bill um, says that we must apply comparable residential density to the commercial use or the commercial uh, district. Okay. So let me ask this question because I mean, perhaps so I can try to understand what we're trying to do here. So there were several bills from the previous legislature and then the next legislature, several bills, these included what's What's breaking down? What's the problem? What are they trying to force? Is that a fair way to say that? I mean, yeah, very good. I think it, um, 
I, I'm going to give my opinion. Again, this is my opinion, but other people in the room who've been doing this a lot longer than I have will probably have different p uh, views or additional comments to provide. I'm sure you have a better perspective than I do. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's kind of addressing um, COVID and uh, there's been a lot of commercial storefronts that have kind of been boarded up, lack of use. Um, we we maybe have less people going to the office than we typically saw before COVID. And so I think the state is looking at how can we reappropriate those properties from something that is no longer being used to something that we desperately need, which is housing. Um, so that's why you're seeing again in these bills, one of the earlier ones that we talked about, but isn't we're not asking for feedback on was the conversion of commercial to residential. So that was um, House Bill 2984. And that basically says you can convert a commercial property to a residential use. There are just a few like areas where you can't do that. But in general, um, it's kind of a free for all. There's no income requirements on that. It's just um, if you can meet the the standards in the, in the bill and in the code. I would agree with what Haley just said. The only other additional thing I would say is that um, the legislature, you know, each of these bills is coming from a different legislator and that's what's making it so complicated because they're not using the same approach in each bill. And so um, there are all these one-offs. Um, as you said previously, um, previous legislatures have tried to deal with this. We have these three bills from the most recent legislature. Haley may talk about one that just passed last month or earlier this month that we're going to try to fold in. So uh, um, in the effort to respond to the crisis of the housing supply, they're doing a lot of these like, well, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And it's not a very comprehensive approach to addressing the issue, which um, makes all these edits um, not consistent across the board, which is why it ends up being complicated. Yeah, it looks like to me, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, it looks like to me, they're just trying to burn up FTE. I, I mean, I don't see any other thing going on here. Um, go ahead, and then I have a question. A question. I can have a two-part question. So maybe, again, just for my own understanding, a fair synopsis might be that option one uh, appears to have the fewest minimum standards that need to be met as a result of, say, an improvement. So is staff recommending option one over option two and three simply because an improvement that a developer were to come to the city with, there'd be fewer minimum standards that they must adhere to. So therefore option one has greater flexibility and may result in more, a greater chance of income driven household being developed. I think actually a requirement in here was option two was the requirement just because it was a little simpler than this. So again, what you're seeing on the screen, like we talked about, you're seeing the how we're comparing it, right? So like in the neighborhood commercial, we're saying a minimum density is that 16 to four, six to 14 units. And then it, again, it changes community commercial, um, major retail commercial and general office. You, yeah. Um, versus our second option just has um, like minimum densities. We have that uh, 20 units if you're just a residential and commercial district or 12 units if you're in a mixed use structure. And then just if you are building a mixed use structure, 10% of the ground floor has to be a commercial use. That's it for density. Um, it's a little simpler and it allows, I guess you could say, higher density options than um, what you're seeing in the NC district, um, probably what you're seeing in the, in the CC and the GO district. So higher density options across the board and maybe just a little simpler um, requirements. Yeah, it seems to me that option two is is more more straightforward, a little more, it, it, it seems to lend a little more clarity um, to the process and especially for developers who are looking for um, land to develop for income qualified housing that um, maybe there, there's a, a um, better sense of clarity no matter what lot they're looking at versus they have to dive into the weeds a little bit more um, on, on the zoning under option one, right. find out what's allowable. Right. I'm inclined to say option two is better because this other grid is too complicated. <laughs> but, uh, so under, um, under general provisions fees, um, can you, so the, 
so this is uh, sorry for a period of affordability. Is that the five years that fees would be waived in this situation? This is uh, under thirty three ninety five minor code corrections um, two dot one one thirty five fees. Um, this period of affordability is that the five years that? Um, yeah. So. The 2.1135 fees, that's just for uh, like an application. So a developer submits an application and they want a fee waiver for the application fee itself. So if they submitted a site plan review, which is typically what we require for any type of development, um, they could get a fee waiver for submitting that application. Um, if they weren't in qualified housing, we generally don't allow a fee waiver for that. Um, and yes, that five years is what we require for the fee waiver. Um, but we also require additional time that you qualify for that income qualified housing for funding sources under the other under the general provisions for income qualified housing. So just to get your fee waiver, you have to say, I agree to five years, but then to build the income qualified housing itself, then we require like the 30 years that it's, it's guaranteed to be income qualified housing. Okay. You have one whole more section to go over, don't you? Or is this it? Mm -hmm. This is it. Yeah. These are the, awesome. these are the options, unless there were other things that nope. people had questions about. <laughs> I understand it is a little co complicated and basically what, what we were trying to get out of this work session is just how would you like us to proceed with the options that we presented so that we can incorporate them into our staff report and we can include them in the draft code that then gets approved at the public hearing and then goes forward to city council and board of county commissioners. Sorry. Um, so we're gonna, I guess what I can't get my head around is is that in the other case option one was kind of you know as it is now kind of open um but if our fear is is that these bills that are coming are not going to allow us to control the growth of the city then it seems to me that we need to go to more restrictive options um otherwise i just soon leave it um for us to determine the city to determine uh, what was appropriate for the city in that location at that time. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents word. That takes us to almost seven o'clock. So we're going to roll over into our actual meeting here in just a second. All right, hearing no other questions, thank you very much. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Do you need to take off before we start? No. Okay. You said you couldn't come to this section of the meeting. Oh, I meant um, on the second one. Okay. Yeah, great. We're going to exist till seven. We're not, we can't take off early, right? I mean, we can't create the meeting early. 659. Oh, <laughs> nothing done. Nothing done. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything we're waiting for? <laughs> Good. Great. I hereby open the regular meeting of the Springfield Planning Commission. Uh, and our attendance is the same, so we don't need a roll call. Uh, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, those in attendance, please recite the pledge. Those online, please stay muted. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go to the approval of the minutes from February 21st. Are there any corrections to the minutes as published in the packet? No? Great. Are there no corrections? And the minutes are approved. Uh, do we have any business from the audience? Um, so we do have one person who is online. If you would like to speak, you can raise your hand so that we can um, allow you to speak under business from the audience. Not seeing a hand raised and no public in the room, so. Okay, well, we do have somebody in the audience, so I will say this. Uh, I would like to ask members of the audience who are joining us by phone or online, please keep yourselves on mute until you are called to provide public testimony. If you would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom using the reactions feature or press nine if joining by phone. If you are here in person, please fill out a request to speak card and present it to the planning commission assistant. When called upon to speak, please state your name and mailing address and keep your comments to three minutes. Okay. Uh, now we have business from the Planning Commission. Are there any reports on council action? I did. So I have a report on City Council work session on February 26th, 2024. Uh, there are only two agenda items. Uh, the first, uh, councilors discussed Peace Health, Peace Health Rides bike share program and they supported working with Cascadia Mobility on next steps. And the second agenda item was a discussion of master fees and charges, um, an annual update where the council reviewed appropriateness of fees and charges. For Commissioner Thompson, can way. you speak a little louder, please? I don't think everybody can hear you. Okay. Do you want me to start from the beginning or was I good enough? Go for it. He's <laughs> good. Okay. Where's the uh, microphone? So I know. Um, it's actually tied to Oh, it's way over there. Okay. Yeah. Sarah, he's loud and clear. It's good. Okay. Just keep rolling. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm clear up here. So. Okay. Well, I can start one more time. Yeah. There's two ad agenda items for the February 26, 2024 city council session. Um, the councilors discussed the Peace Health Rides bike share program, and they supported working with Cascadia Mobility on next steps. And the second agenda item was the master fees and charges annual update for 2024. And the council reviewed appropriateness of fees and charges for fiscal year 2025. And I'll do it. Thank you. So I had two uh, January 16th. There was no meeting. And then uh, March 11th uh, was interviews for Bi Bicycle and uh, Pedestrian Advisory Committee, Budget Committee uh, interviews, uh, and then Public uh, Library Advisory Board interviews, and Springfield uh, History Museum Advisory Committee interviews. That was the session, the uh, complete session. Okay. Any other reports? And any other business from the Planning Commission? Okay. Uh, any business from the Development and Public Works Department? I'll share two things. One is um, you've been having meetings about once a month, but we're coming into a busy time. So plan on twice a month uh, with some major agenda items coming up. So at your next meeting, you will have a public hearing on these code amendments. Um, and that will be by yourselves, but prior to that would be a joint um, work session and public hearing with Lane County Planning Commission to go over the Willamette Lane Comprehensive Plan, which would be adopted as a land use element of our comprehensive plan. Um, and then following that will be some land use decisions um, due to development applications that will be coming your way and such. So. Um, please do keep on top of your email and get a head start on your packets because they will will be hefty. Um, and then the other item I wanted to share also is um, tomorrow the city will be launching the information on our website and social media and such about the street bond project. So uh, do take a look at um, that information so that you're informed um, that we'll be going to election 
on May 21st. Um, that's all that I have here. Um, Haley, did you get what you needed from us? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, well, that I will adjourn the Planning Commission regular meeting. Good job, everyone. Good job, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the apple that comes out. It's really good fishing. We got to adjourn pretty fast.